Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Phil Fisher's Brexit webinar series. Today, we'll be covering an overview of the ongoing Brexit negotiations so that you can look at where we are now um, based on the, the seismic changes of the past week or past few days uh, and what you can do to prepare for the different eventualities. And um, we hope that this is a, a very timely um, and, and useful webinar for you. Uh, now, this session is the latest in a series of webinars hosted by Phil Fisher's uh, Brexit Task Force. Each webinar so far is available on our YouTube channel. Um, we caught this a shot of COVID and a chaser of Brexit months ago. Um, somewhat ironically, if you're based in England, these will be the only shots that you're able to get outside of your house today. Um, but today, we are looking at the significant developments in the key area of supply chains, uh, providing a recap of the current position, and offering some practical advice to businesses and organizations in this ever-changing and difficult political environment. I'm James Caller. I'm a partner in the Field Fisher Commercial Group. And whilst I've been part of the group advising clients on the eventualities and preparations for Brexit over the past four years, the no deal prospect has once again reached fever pitch. And as such, we've seen a rise in inquiries from businesses seeking to review and appraise their existing plans or, or perhaps develop new strategies. And this is obviously set against the impending backdrop of a new national lockdown in England and various other measures taken across the UK and parts of Europe in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, with me today is Richard Tafare. Richard is an advisor in Field Fisher's international trade team, a specialist in compliance, trade and financial sanctions, export controls, Brexit, customs procedures and supply chain management. Richard was a Foreign Service Officer in the FCO for 35 years and now International Trade Advisor and Consultant with Phil Fisher on all matters Brexit and trade. A um, bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you've got any questions, please use the question box in your control panel. It's on the right hand side of your screen as you look. Um, we'll aim to get through as many of those as possible uh, during the course of the webinar, but if you don't get time to answer them all, then we or one of the team will follow up with you individually. As I've mentioned already, all of our sessions are recorded and available on the Field Fisher website, and I'm contractually obliged to say our exciting YouTube channel. Um, we'll have those details for you at the end of the session. So let's get started. We want to cover um, five main topics in the course of the next half hour or so. Um, so set out on the screen for you there. Um, we'll cover where we are now, what does this all really mean, and how you can prepare, hopefully keeping it focused on the practical aspects with some key takeaways as to what you can do now to either best prepare your business for the end of the transition period on the 1st of January and or limit the rupture or, or impact upon your um, supply chain. So firstly, kicking off with the, a roundup of where we are now, we actually wrote these slides a few weeks ago, not quite knowing where we'd be today. Although given 2020 so far, we should probably have written these this morning, um, given that there's probably still a few gaps in, in uh, knowledge and expectation of where we are. Um, the elephant in, in every room at the minute is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, this has caused a fracture in everyday life, not just to consumers, but all throughout the supply chain from the supply side spike we saw in Q1 when Asia was initially impacted by the virus, moving rapidly to a demand side spike in Q2 and beyond, which has led to an unprecedented attempts by governments and policymakers the world over to ensure the steady flow of capital around the globe to keep the world as we know it ticking over, with the intention being that there will be a return to normal at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, this is obviously an unprecedented change in behaviours, the likes of which has not been seen um, for over a century. Uh, it's set against the backdrop of increasing geopolitical friction uh, arising from a divorce from a globalist, outward-looking policy from governments across both emerging and developed nations. Uh, the move towards uh, nationalist governments and policies in recent years has, has obviously resulted in a more um, inward-looking approach to trade. and most notably between um, the UK and the EU, and, and also particularly the relationship between the US and China, um, which will obviously be entering into a new phase, um, one might expect based on the news this morning from January onwards. Um, I had a, a, a note um, to mention the US election here, um, and obviously whilst we are still awaiting the final results of that, um, difficult to say quite what's going to happen, but one thing to sort of bear in mind looking forward 
over the next few months is whether or not this will signal a change in approach uh, from the US towards a more globalist approach or, or whether or not there'll be a continuation of the previous administration's policy of America first. Um, there, there are certainly some um, domestic measures that will be on the agenda and probably take priority over international trade, um, which is worth bearing in mind if you um, if you are trading uh, outside of Europe and in, in the US. Uh, wrapping this up into a concise summary, um, what we've seen is, is many clients of businesses um, across the developed world um, addressing each of these impacts upon supply chain in several key ways, um, the underlying watchword here being resilience. It's important to bear in mind here that when we talk about this modern supply chain, we are seldom talking about a, a, a linear chain link, but more likely a complex integrated network of suppliers and subcontractors. And it's in this context that we look to address the issues that businesses are facing. Um, we've seen many businesses seeking to shorten supply chains so as to remove the reliance upon third countries, third party countries paying ball, um, which has resulted in near shoring or, or reshoring of supply chains across several sectors. One of the trends that has become apparent is the diversification of um, supply chains, reducing reliance on a particular supplier and spreading risk across multiple suppliers, subcontractors and territories. This obviously creates an additional burden um, for, for client businesses, um, but has, has in some cases proved effective in mitigating the risk of failure in a particular part of the supply chain as, as perhaps been exposed by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so what does this all mean for the UK in particular? Well, it seems clear that the built-in resilience may prove to be opposite in dealing with the apparent march towards a no deal by the end of the year, but the effects of Brexit are obviously more likely to be localized and less profound relative to the pandemic. However, it's probably likely to say that the uh, effects could be more long lasting, particularly as the UK seeks to um, pursue a strategy of regulatory divergence and, and, uh, and autonomy away from um, the confines of its um, European relationships. Well, as I've said, um, by this point, Richard and I were hoping that maybe some meat on the bones of a trade deal and a, and, and a new um, or a confirmed president in the US, uh, alas, no such luck, um, whilst there may be a deal. Um, it seems unlikely at this point that it's gonna be anything more than a thin wedge away from no deal. The UK has been here before, of course, last year, um, but this really is it. Um, the UK has obviously been outside the, the EU for uh, around a year, and the transition is coming to a hard stop on 31st December. And whilst discussions are, we're told, intensifying day by day, each day that passes reduces the likelihood of a substantive deal being reached significantly, especially given the approval process that would need to follow ultimate agreement of the negotiating teams. Somewhat alarmingly for um, UK PLC, as you'll see from the slide, uh, is that a significant minority of businesses um, reported that their preparations for Brexit had gone backwards since the start of the year, likely because of coronavirus contingency planning, but also the effect of an un un uncertainty around the Brexit deal or, 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 or no deal. Perhaps even more concerning is that as recently as last month, 60% of UK business reported that they were not at all clear on the details of what happens post 1st January. It's not quite clear what the other 40% think, but may not be a long shot to assume that there may be some differences in interpretation. Um, it's worth remembering, of course, at this point that a deal may offer some certainty, um, but either way, we still create a border that figuratively hasn't existed um, between the UK and the EU um, in 40 years, which is obviously going to lead to a requirement for customs declarations, security declarations, checks, rules of origin issues, and, and, and compliance. Um, all of this additional friction obviously will present a logistical challenge in some sectors, um, potentially an expensive and complex one. Perhaps one, what we conclude now is that given there are 35 working days between now and Christmas Day, it's that any deal agreed will likely be wafer thin. So rather than a discussion between no deal and, uh, and a substantive deal, it would be sensible to approach the next stage on a, a no deal footing. Um, regardless of an actual deal being reached in the next 35 days, it's um, safe to assume that there'll be potentially significant friction on a trade deal between the EU, the UK, and wider relationships where the EU has uh, FTAs in place with third countries. Um, and it remains um, that confidence is still extraordinarily fragile given the COVID-19 crisis. Um, a disruptive souring in those relations between the UK and the EU off the back of these negotiations could weigh on global risk sentiment and, and also likely asset prices as well. Um, 
one um, key indicator of this will likely be um, the, the value of sterling, um, which some have predicted could fall by around about 10% um, in a no deal scenario. Um, conversely, this may actually um, lead to a practical uh, benefit of um, potentially um, reducing the costs of um, exports, but then again, on the other side, may um, be offset by some of the increased costs in the integrated supply chains. Um, we must expect, therefore, that there's probably a good degree of negotiations to take place into 2021, um, most likely leveraged off the back of the apparent impact that a no or very thin deal will have on either side. Um, so hopefully we'll address some of those concerns today. And um, before we do um, kick off um, getting on with our first topic, um, we'd like to run a poll of viewers of the webinar, um, and we'll relay these back to you soon, hopefully sooner than in the US. So while waiting for that to come back in, um, Richard, over to you for our first topic. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, James, and good morning, everyone. Well, that, the response to the poll looked a little bit more hopeful, um, but there was still a number of people saying they weren't quite prepared yet. So, also at 27%, uh, not yet prepared. Um, so, we've got this coming down the road at us in um, probably less than eight weeks' time. Can we have the, the next slide? So, customs and VAT. I'm, just gonna, I'm hoping that nothing on this slide will be a surprise to anyone uh, who's uh, watching. Um, the UK uh, HMRC has published a new UK border operating model, uh, a very large document, but if you're in the supply chains business, you're moving goods between the UK and the EU, you really do need to have a look at that. Um, it talks about customs declarations, VAT, uh, there are going to, clearly going to be risks of some border delays, but the UK government, to its credit, has done what it can, I think, to um, put in the new arrangements in a phased way so that it won't all come into effect straight from the 1st of January. Um, certainly for the main elements of customs uh, declarations and duty payments for most goods can be postponed for the first six months. Um, for some goods, however, it will start from the 1st of January and for animal and animal products, uh, there will be a start in from the 1st of January that will get phased up in April. So there was a phasing on the UK side that doesn't yet appear to have been reflected on the EU side. So whilst goods coming into the UK um, will hopefully be able to move reasonably smoothly, goods going out to the EU, it could be a different story. And whether or not the uh, free trade agreement uh, is agreed and um, uh, includes some simplifications. I think we have to acknowledge that we're going to have to live with these changes, like it or not, in, in eight weeks' time and be ready to uh, adjust and implement them as necessary. Um, can we go into the next slide, please, James? I've got a few sort of practical tips to um, focus on in the meantime. So again, if you haven't done these already, you really do need to get moving. Um, basics for customs declarations include having an AORI number. Um, you need to know the classification, the tariff code of your goods, because uh, that will need to be included in the declaration. So you need to have goods valuation calculated. Whether or not there are tariffs, you'll still be paying VAT, so evaluation will be required. You're going to need, if you haven't got them already, trained in-house staff or um, contracted customs agents. You need clarity, if you haven't got it already, on your INCO terms, the, the contract terms that determine who's shipping, uh, who's paying insurance, freight and so forth. I've had a number of uh, rather urgent questions over recent weeks about those who are using DDP, that's delivery duty paid terms which have some fairly major consequences for them and for their buyers. So if you are using DDP, do take a look at that. Uh, again, if you haven't prepared for it already, check out what you might be able to do to avoid border delays. It's already evident that a number of shippers are rerouting their products uh, to avoid the Dover Straits, where I think something like 75% of UK um, continental Europe trade takes place. 
the Dover Straits are likely to be the main bottleneck, so if you can move your goods away from there, so much the better. COVID is not helping by creating congestion at ports with a shortage of containers and a shortage of dock workers. So again, this is not happening at the best possible time. And if you are moving goods, if you're importing goods from outside of the EU or even within the EU, and then you'll be processing them or simply warehousing them before you move them on again, uh, do look at the custom special procedures that are available to you. I'll stop there and hand you back to James. Thanks, Richard. On to um, tariffs. So, uh, the export of products across the UK and EU border will obviously necessitate the payment of tariffs on a number of goods which were not payable whilst the UK was a member of the EU. And tariffs obviously vary uh, depending on the product in question. Um, there are two feasible scenarios arising in the event of a deal or no deal outcome. The first is the deal outcome and uh, no or low tariffs are achieved across certain sectors. Then the likely outcome is that exporters of the EU will need to fulfill rules of origin requirements. Um, if the UK and the EU enter into a free trade agreement, understanding the economic origin of your goods will be key to determining if the business could benefit from zero tariffs, i.e. no duty at import, which is a typical benefit of the uh, agreements of this type. Um, the benefit is obviously only available where rules relating to the economic origin of goods can be met. And the key to developing a robust preparation plan in the event of an ODL scenario will be to fully understand your supply chains, both purchases from suppliers and sales to end customers. And you'll probably need to look at these two in a level of detail, perhaps not previously done, um, uh, determining what you are buying and, and, and from who. Um, so in the absence of a, a, a UK-EU agreement, the goods traded between them will be subject to non-preferential rules or of origin requirements. They're used to determine uh, whether goods are subject to anti-dumping or anti-subsidy measures or quotas and for fiscal or, or, or labelling purposes. <clears throat> um, this is obviously going to impose uh, a new administrative burden requiring the determination then the declaration of uh, customers of the origin of each product, um, either the country where it was wholly obtained or where the substantial working or, or, or processing was carried out. Um, similar requirements are probably all likely to be introduced for trade between UK and third countries with which the EU has a free trade agreement, unless it was agreed to continue this on a, on, on a bilateral basis. Um, earlier this year, the government announced the UK's new tariff regime, the UK Global Tariff. Um, this replaces the EU's common external tariff on the 1st of January at the end of the transition period. With UKGT, the government aims to make it easier and cheaper for businesses to import from overseas, but recognizing the need to protect UK producers. The result of this is likely that 60% of trade come into the UK tariff-free on WTO terms um, or, or through existing preferential access, um, which is a higher percentage of tariff-free goods than currently applies under the EU's common external tariff. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the government might revise the UK GT at any time before as well as after the 1st of January. And we're encouraging clients to be alert to this and, and continuously check for updates. Um, the government is maintaining tariffs on a number of products with the intention of, uh, as it says, backing UK industries such as agriculture, uh, automotive and fishing. Um, some tariffs are being maintained to support imports from the world's poorest countries that benefit from preferential access to the UK market as well. Um, the most um, apparent of the changes so far include rounding tariffs down to standardised percentages, um, scrapping what the government labels as unnecessary tariff variations and nuisance tariffs below 2%. Uh, and UKGT also removes thousands of um, tariff variations on products um, such as a product like biscuits, uh, pizzas, uh, confectionery. Um, uh, products with zero duty include goods used in UK production as well as finished goods such as um, copper tubes, screws, bolts, dishwashers, etc. So in terms of um, practical actions um, for you to take, uh, all traders who move goods across the UK EU border should review the supply chain and the origins of products, including components and raw materials, and assess whether any of those goods will qualify as being of UK or, or EU origin, and, and where possible, considering um, reshoring supply chains um, to minimize currency volatility and upgrade the UK origin quotient of uh, products. Um, as I've already mentioned, checking the UK GT for any changes to classification or duty rate on the goods, 
um, ensuring that there's su sufficient in-house customs knowledge and adequate customs compliance controls in place by the 1st of January, and also monitoring future agreements on tariff-free access to EU markets, which may be conditional on the origin of such goods. Also worth bearing in mind not to forget the issue of Northern Ireland here as well, um, depending on the um, deal reached with the EU um, in the event of a zero-zero uh, tariff on a UK-EU trade agreement, it's likely that there'll be rules of origin requirements from the UK to NI um, with certification required to prove origin. Um, tariff relief on some goods for tackling coronavirus um, may also um, stay around as well, so bear that in mind too. So the tariff from VAT have been removed on some goods. Um, it's likely to be continued to be reviewed towards the end of the year and, and continue to apply if necessary. This brings us on to our um, next poll. Um, so will your business be affected if a UK EU trade agreement requires at least 50% of the value of goods to originate in the UK or the EU in order to qualify for duty-free access? And I'll hand over to Richard, um, pick up on regulations and he can feed back the, the results of the poll. Thanks, James. Just waiting for the results to come up on that one. Okay, so that's about half of people not affected. Um, about a third are affected and not far short of a fifth don't yet know. Um, so that I hope, I hope is just a quick snapshot of the fact that even if we do get a free trade agreement, um, that there's still going to be quite a lot of issues to work through in order to ensure that your goods can can qualify. So moving on to regulations. Um, so as you will no doubt know, because of the um, uh, uh, the UK Withdrawal Act that was passed uh, about two years ago now, um, automatically on the 1st of January, um, the UK will adopt all EU regulations into UK law. So the, there will in effect be no change in the great majority of regulations that affect products. Um, and they will remain aligned if the uh, regulations happen to be based on regional and international standards. But for others, there may be divergence in due course. Indeed, that is part of the purpose of Brexit, to enable the UK Parliament to be sovereign and to change regulations if it sees fit. Um, some goods will face immediate checks at the border or near the border, particularly animal or animal products. Um, some goods that require conformity assessments, the processes for those will change. Um, the validity of UK certificates uh, will no longer um, be maintained in the EU and vice versa, uh, unless there is mutual recognition of certification. Uh, that may be something that, that is included in the agreement. One would certainly expect it to be, but we don't know. Um, I should mention the UK CA mark, the UK Conformity assess, uh, uh, Accreditation mark, that will come into use from the 1st of January. Uh, for a transitional period of a year, um, traders can continue to use the CE mark where that is currently required on their goods. So you can continue to use the CE mark for another year, unless during the course of next year, um, the UK and the EU rules should diverge. But from the 1st of January 2022, you will only be able to use the UK CA mark in the UK. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for manufacturers, the responsibilities essentially won't change, but it's important to be aware that uh, your current distributors or retailers in the EU will become your importers and vice versa. So if you are currently acting as a distributor or possibly a retailer for an EU manufacturer, you will become their importer. Now, I won't get into the details of that too far, but there are certain responsibilities that come with being an importer. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've completed the customs requirements. That's not part of being the importer. The importer in this sense is the, the legal responsibilities that come with being in effect the first legal entity to take ownership of those goods in the UK. 
And that includes all these responsibilities that you see on the slide. I think the main one to pick out at this stage is the requirement on labeling and packaging that the importer's name, trademark, and address needs to be on the product. Um, and that comes into effect from the 1st of January. So I don't know, already I know from a number of clients, they're looking very closely at uh, how they're going to manage this and ensure that they've identified who is the importer. Are they the importer or is it their distributor in the EU that's the importer? And so should their name and address be on the product? Next slide, please. So for importers, be aware of who they are and what the new responsibilities are. If you require third party conformity assessments, hopefully you've done this already, but if not, you're going to need to transfer your certificate to uh, an EU notified body or apply for new certificates from an EU notified body. The same applies in reverse. If you're in the aerospace, chemical, pharma, food or other businesses, you're going to need safety certifications. And certain other businesses will need various registrations, for example, particularly the chemical industry. And do watch out for any divergence in the regulations that might take place. As I say, it will start off the same, um, but we don't know how long it will remain the same. Um, next slide, please. So we have a poll. Uh, and the question is, if you will become an importer of goods from the EU, are you prepared for the new responsibilities that this will involve? I'll leave you to vote. So, there we are. So three quarters are prepared, but a quarter are not. So yeah, that again, with eight weeks to go, shows that we're not there yet. So I would urge those who are not clear on this issue to um, uh, do by all means get in touch with us uh, or you know, uh, get advice from uh, your manufacturer, the person who's selling you goods so that you can clarify your respective responsibilities. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to move on now to non-EU trade. Um, and the next slide, this is just gives you a quick snapshot of who the UK's main trading partners are. And the main takeaway is in the bottom line there that, yes, the US is clearly the UK's biggest single trading partner, um, which accounts for about 17% of UK trade. But 46% of UK, UK trade is with the EU. Having said that, since the US is the biggest uh, partner, then there are efforts underway to strike a trade deal with the US. You may have seen there have been some demonstrations about this. So for the US-UK uh, deal, um, it's one of the major uh, potential benefits of Brexit, so it's been presented. Um, and both sides have said that they want far-reaching tariff reductions and increased market access. So it could be a big political prize for the UK. Um, we're told that both sides are confident that a comprehensive agreement is not far away and that the talks have reached an advanced stage. They've already agreed on mutual recognition for conformity assessment. A lot of it will depend on whether there is a change in US administration. If President Trump remains in place, then there will be no, the negotiations continue uh, very much on their present track. Although there could still be difficulties over regulatory standards, for example, the, the famous chlorinated chickens, uh, but also US uh, pressure to get increased access to the NHS med, uh, market for medicines. If, on the other hand, President uh, Biden uh, takes over, there could be just inevitable delays from the new, uh, new administration becoming established. Uh, and then we don't know very clearly what the position of the democratic administration will be towards the uh, UK-US deal. It may well be that they will not prioritize it as highly as the Trump administration and that they will focus more on striking a deal with the EU. That's speculation for now. We will see. Over to you, James. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> so, um, Richard's covered uh, US trade. Um, so in terms of um, rest of the world, 
Um, UK has obviously got two separate challenges here when it comes to the countries uh, negotiating continuity or, or rollover agreements with countries around the world that already have preferential trading deals with the EU. It's made slightly more complicated by the fact that there is no settled deal with the EU with many countries perhaps preferring to see what that looks like before committing. Um, so far, it can be said that UK has been largely successful, um, although the scope of the replacement agreements varies. Uh, for example, the UK Switzerland agreement covers trade in um, goods and government procurement, um, whereas the UK uh, South Korea agreement is more extensive, covering trade in goods, services, IP, and government procurement. On a slightly more positive note, uh, the agreement with Japan could hopefully be a springboard for the UK's desired entry into the much larger uh, comprehensive and progressive trans Pacific partnership, a multi country agreement that also includes Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, even so, it remains to be seen that the the ability of UK manufacturers to benefit from the uh, these deals um, will be affected by whether or not there is a deal with the EU. Um, if there is no deal, manufacturers may not be able to count um, EU inputs as, as local content as they perhaps currently do to qualify for those preferential tariffs. Um, maybe problematic for those with extensive cross-border supply chains. Meanwhile, obviously agreements have yet to be finalized with the likes of Canada, which did not agree to a simple um, rollover agreement. Um, so in terms of um, practical steps, um, we suggest that developments are continue to be um, monitored throughout. Um, consider uh, lobbying or engaging with um, the government's concern as well. Um, preparation for the possibility that the UK doesn't actually conclude those agreements with all the countries with which it has existing arrangements um, and how this might impact on, on tariffs and, uh, and other uh, non-tariff barriers as well. Um, and EU firms have been encouraged to look for non-UK uh, non content to, um, to be sure of benefiting from low tariff rates. And it, it's obviously plain that um, there needs to be uh, investigation into whether or not um, there is any way for you to, to mitigate this in relation to your business. Um, so uh, that draws the um, webinar to a conclusion, apart from any questions that you might have. Um, I think there is a, a quick one um, here that I'll throw over to you, um, Richard. Um, so this is a, a question around movement of technology kit between internal group from UK to EU located staff um, and, and a query as to whether or not this will uh, need to cease. I, I guess this is in the event of a, a no deal outcome. Well, thanks, James. So I just turned my camera back on. Yeah, so this is a question about moving, uh, transferring technology. Um, between the UK and the EU, um, if I understand that right. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, it depends, obviously it's going to depend on what the technology is. Um, the, the main control that exists on technology comes under the um, export controls, um, where if the technology is related to anything military, uh, or it's classified as what's called dual use, um, it would require a license. Currently, transfers of military technology or goods between the UK and the EU member states does require a license, but transfers of dual use goods or technology does not. Um, but from the 1st of January, um, that will no longer be the case and you will need a license to move this type of technology or goods between the UK and the EU. Um, there are licenses available, the UK has made an, what they call an open general export license available for the transfer of dual use goods, that's hardware, software and technology from the UK to the EU. So it's a very simple uh, license that's been already published, you can go online and register for it immediately and start to use it from the 1st of January. Um, the EU has been a bit slower off the mark, but it's just announced yesterday that it's going to, it's proposed uh, to adopt a regulation that will add the UK to an existing EU license that applies to exports of dual use goods to Norway, Switzerland, Japan, Australia, Canada, the USA. Um, and once that's done, and we assume it will be in place by the 1st of January, then that will 
massively simplify the process of moving dual use goods and technology from the EU to the UK. So both sides are doing what they can to minimize the paperwork, but nonetheless, there will be some and it will be a legal requirement. And if you do not uh, have those li license, export license in place, it will be um, a civil and a criminal offense. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. Um, doesn't appear that there's any other questions, but if anyone does, feel free to let us know. Um, so that just remains me to um, sign off with uh, some details of where you can get some further support on this. As Richard already said, feel free to contact one of the team um, directly um, if you have any questions on this. But we've already got some, some resources available for our clients as well. So on our website, you'll see a practical checklist. Um, there's our Phil Fisher Brexit blog, which is updated regularly. Um, we have a Brexit task force hotline as well, which you can find on our, our website. And don't forget to visit the YouTube channels with um, details of our uh, previous um, webinars on. Um, I'll put the team up here, but then very quickly pivot over to just talk you through um, our next two um, sessions that are happening next week and the week after. Um, the next week is on uh, Brexit and the commercial transactions um, and no deal planning. Um, so I'll see you again for that next week. Um, and I'll just say thank you for everyone for joining today's session. Um, I hope you found it really useful. Um, as mentioned, you can access this and other recordings on our YouTube channel uh, and our, through our website. And if you do have any questions that weren't answered, then feel free to get in contact with um, one of the team. Uh, keep safe and we hope you can join us in the next couple of weeks. Thanks very much. Thank you.